Hello, in the last video um, I did an impromptu little uh, inspirational message about um, the consequences of sin and I referred to the Bema Seat judgment of Christ. You know, the point of that message really, the good news about it, is that when Jesus Christ comes, he will not come with reference to our sin and the judgment seat for the believers is a judgment that is put in the context of a uh, the Greek uh, it, it's kind of modeled after the Greek Olympics where you're competing for rewards and we're not competing against each other I think we are um, each running our own race you know and the question is not one of sin at the judgment seat of Christ because that was dealt with at the cross but one of um, whether or not we have a reward based on how we build and what kind of material we use <laughs> in this life and that was a pretty I think it was a fairly encouraging message but this I want to do a little study um, on the judgment seat of Christ because I think confusion in this area produces terror for people even though we know we're saved as Christians if you fear seeing the Lord because you think he's going to be unhappy with you and that you're going to receive some kind of recompense for your sins, as if your sins have not been dealt with at the cross, then number one, there's no way that you're going to be eager to see him. Number two, there's no way that you're going to run to him in your daily life and believe that he's your friend. And if you don't believe you, you're his friend, then there's no way you're going to live in his presence. And if you don't live in his presence, then there's no way you're going to overcome any kind of sin. Because it's only in his presence and with the power of his spirit that you can conquer anything in this life that the enemy in your flesh and the devil and Satan and the world throws at you. And also, there's no way that you'll have any fruit for the Lord because everything has to be wrought by God working in you by the grace of Christ so it's really critical that we see that the atmosphere has changed since the resurrection of Christ and that we are not going to Mount Sinai with the where the mountain is covered with smoke and we can't approach it because we're in fear and trembling but we're coming to a festal gathering uh, a place of rejoicing and Hebrews actually refers to that actually I'm, I'm kind of inspired I'll, I'll just bring that up real quick um, so you can read it okay Hebrews 12 says for you have not come unto the mount that can be touched that burned with fire nor into blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they heard and entreated that it should not be spoken to them any more for they could not endure that which was commanded if such so much as a beast even touched the mountain it'll be stoned or thrust through the dark so terrible was the sight that Moses said I exceedingly fear and quake but you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse him uh, not that speaks. And then he talks about, you know, for if they escape not who refused him who spoke on earth much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven so this kind of actually is talking about not refusing the heavenly revelation the the voice that speaks from heaven is the ascended Christ the enthroned Christ who revealed all the realities that had been ushered in after his resurrection that had changed the whole atmosphere for us and made it uh, transferred us out of a place of fear where we've not been given a spirit of bondage bringing us again into fear but instead brought us to this festal gathering to Mount Zion to this great uh, rejoicing place and now we have Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and his blood that speaks on our behalf and 
this is a totally new environment where we are now given the spirit of sonship in which we cry abba father and the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god so i like to see this section in romans 8 as kind of the same thing you know romans 8 talks about how under the law we were we had the spirit of bondage bringing us again into fear because we were slaves under that under sin and we were destined for judgment and to us because of the law god was unapproachable because he was on this smoking mount and everything about him spoke of judgment of course you can't approach but now because we've been given the spirit of sonship because of the resurrection of christ we have a witness in our spirit that we are the children of god and we cry abba father which is the you know intimate address to the father and he bears witness that we are children of god so there's a smile on his face and we need to understand that the atmosphere has changed in resurrection and we're in a whole new place in the lord and if we have that kind of view that uh, the judgment for us is a place to be to not be looking forward to then we're not going to look forward to his coming genuinely and we're not going to look forward to him in our daily life and it's going to affect our life for sure so the base the foundation is really having a vision of what this new atmosphere is like and how the Lord loves us and his smile upon us and then the judgment seat becomes not a place of fear but a great motivation and a place that we're rushing towards we're running if you're like for example in in the olympics and you're running you're running to get to the end of the finish line so that you can have a reward or a prize you're running for the prize but if you think that the finish line, there's a guy standing there with a gun and he's going to shoot you, you're not going to run to the end of that race. You're going to run away. You're going to get off course. So once again, it is very important that we have the right contextualization of these things. Um, so I thought I'd do a little study on the judgment seats that we see in the New Testament um, to distinguish the one that we're going to be at to the others that are mentioned. Because... Francis Chan and a lot of these lordship guys and reform people, because they allegorize all the promises of the Old Testament, allegorize the kingdom, they're confused. And they put the church in the wrong places. They put the church in Matthew 25, at uh, which is a different judgment seat, and they even put the church at the great right throne judgment, and then they put the requirements and the judgments around those judgments on us. And that brings a lot of fear to people. So, um, real quick, let's look at those. There is the Matthew 25 judgment. Let's read that real quick. Oops. Okay. This is where it says at the end of Matthew 25, When the Son of Man shall come and glory, and all the holy angels with him, and he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw you hungered and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink, when did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed thee? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king shall answer them, Verily I say unto you, unless, or inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. And then I'm not going to read the rest, but then he said, well, okay, then he said to the one on the left, the goats depart from me you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels and they didn't visit him right and they said well when didn't we visit you he said and as much as you did it to the least of these you did it not to me these shall go away to everlasting punishment but the righteous to life eternal okay so that is a judgment seat now what does he say about the context of it it is when he comes and sits upon the throne of his uh, glory that is the davidic throne in jerusalem when he comes to establish the kingdom after the tribulation and sets up his judgment he's going to judge who the nations 
all the nations. He shall separate them from one another based on what? On their treatment of his brethren. Who are his brethren? Well, there's the church, yes, but literally it'll be the Jews in that time of tribulation and those who get saved during that time. Um, some of them will be sheltered and people will prove themselves to be sheep based on whether or not they hide people. Like in the Holocaust, you know, there will be people who are converted and become righteous based on the testimony of these that they shelter. And uh, those people will be going through such hard times. They'll be destitute. They'll be naked. They'll be in prison. That, and these people will be seeking to help them. And it'll be because they believe their testimony, which proves that they're sheep, too. And they will inherit this eternal life uh, of going into the kingdom, okay? That is, they will live forever, and they will be saved in a slightly different way than the church. Um, but that I don't want to get too deep into that. Okay, now, Francis Chan and those guys try to stick the church in here and put them under works. See? You didn't go and have a prison ministry. and See, you didn't go and feed the hungry. You just lived selfishly on this earth and didn't do Faith without works is dead, you know. And he's going to say that you weren't actually saved. You were a goat. And he's going to throw you in the fire. And there are a lot of young people hearing these messages. And people are getting suicidal and despairing of life as they start to contemplate this judgment seat and think that as members of the body of Christ, that's where they're headed. So that's terrible. That is not the judgment seat for the church. That is the judgment seat for the nations when Jesus comes to take the throne and rule with a rod of iron. Okay. Now, we looked at in the study on the rapture that when he comes, he's coming with his saints and they will rule with him. Right? Revelation, uh, let's see, rod of iron. Let's search for these words. It, there's a promise to the overcomers in Revelation 2.27. He that overcomes and keeps my works till the end, will I give him power over the nations, and he shall rule over them with a rod of iron. As vessels of a powder, they shall be broken into shivers, even as I received my father. So this is the saints in this age, the church, members of the body of Christ, who will rule with Christ when he comes. So when he sets up that throne, he's not going to be alone. He's coming with his saints. Uh, and maybe you know that, but let's um, look at what Jude quotes Enoch talking about this. Jude one fourteen says, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment of all, and to convince all that are ungodly upon them of the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed, and all the hard speeches which the sinners have spoken against him. Now, this is uh, a prophecy of Jesus coming to inherit that throne. And we know that he says in Matthew 24 that he will come and set up his throne to judge. But we see in Revelation 2 that that promise is also given to the overcomers in the churches. That the believers will also reign with him. And we see that in Revelation 5 that the 24 elders said we shall reign with him on earth. And part of that reign is to execute judgment. So I don't think you have any idea the position of privilege that you're in. That when you come with the Lord to set up his kingdom. And that was hidden in the Old Testament. It was alluded to. But... Uh, it's not really fully revealed until we understand Paul's mystery that there's this group called the body of Christ that was hidden in Christ, right? And that was crucified with him and raised together with him and enthroned with him, seated with him in the heavenly places, that this was not even alluded to in the Old Testament. And these are not people from the nations or from the, uh, from the house of Israel, but these are members of the body of Christ who have been called out of both Israel and the nations to become a new group of people called the body of Christ, the new man, right? And uh, so when you go back to Matthew 25, once again, it's the nations that are being judged. Uh, Matthew 25, 31, 32, and therefore him shall gather all nations and he shall separate them, the nations from one another. 
what are the nations? Are we the nations? No, we've been saved out of the nations. We are not of this world. We are members of the body of Christ. We're neither Jew or Greek, but we are in that unique entity in which Christ is in all and is all. Okay, so there's that. Um, that is the judgment seat that a lot of people get confused about and try to cast its shadow over the church and that's a dangerous place to be because it'll put you in works righteousness the other one is the great right throne judgment and this is at the end of the book of revelation at the end of the millennium when the devil is finally put into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet were already put a thousand years earlier he says then i saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it whose face uh, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away there's found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which was the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works the sea gave up the dead that were in it death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them and judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death whoever was named was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire now this group of people is not the nations that live during the time that uh jesus comes and sets up his throne because the goats in that time will be thrown into the lake of fire they're already there um the this is those who've died at any other time who did not believe in Christ. If you believed in Christ, you're not in this group because you're not the dead. This is a judgment for the dead, small and great. Are you dead at that time? No, you will have be uh, resurrected at the beginning of the millennium standing with Christ. And this is not for the living, but for the dead. So this is a different group of people. And that great right throne they are judged according to their works. We are not judged according to our works the way they are. That's talking about the law is now showing them why they're going to the lake of fire. Because they have, they are sinners and they never received salvation. So we're not in that judgment. And some people try to put us in there too. Um, but we're not the dead. And we are uh, in a different spot. <laughs> and that does not apply to us either so then what does apply to us and that's where we have what's called the bema judgment seat that paul refers to so let's take a look then at the bema judgment seat let's see how it's used um, a few times in the scriptures and then we'll see how paul uses it because we'll see that paul actually lifts it up and the holy spirit breathes a new set of context and meaning into it and that's the case with a, a number of Greek words where the Bible uses it and the world uses it one way but then the Holy Spirit brings it up a level by applying different contexts to it that puts it in a whole different framework and that's why we have to steer clear of just using dictionaries and really see how it's used throughout the scripture first time we see it is Matthew 27 and that is when Pilate sat down on the judgment seat now if I go over to the King James plus and I go to that verse the judgment seat is G6 or G939 and the Greek word is Bema B-E-M-A and it simply means you know a step or a footstool okay uh, and that's where he sat to make judgment and answer the concerns of the people and issue his decree about, in this case, Barabbas versus Christ. And, you know, it's interesting because in this judgment seat where Pilate sat, he judged Jesus and found him guiltless. So Jesus is standing there as in a sense, as our representative, um, literally. <laughs> and he was found guiltless at that judgment seat. That's kind of interesting. But he was executed 
instead of Barabbas, and that was a decision made at the judgment seat. Now, Barabbas would have been found guilty, but the Jews asked for Barabbas to be let free and for Jesus to be crucified in his stead. So the first time we see judgment seat, if you consider the law of first mention, where the first time a word is brought up in the scripture seems to set the context of it, it's pretty interesting because the first time the word judgment seat, bima, appears in the scripture, we have the context of somebody dying in the place of another. The guilty going free while the guiltless goes to his judgment. That judgment should have been Barabbas. Barabbas should have gone to the cross. He was um, guilty. But the spotless Lamb of God, who was judged guilt-free, went to the cross in his place. Okay? That's the judgment seat. So this is interesting because you think about the judgment seat, and we've been talking about how people are afraid of the judgment seat because they think that's where their sins are going to be held against them, even though they're believers in Christ. No. Actually, the beginning of your judgment seat is right here in Matthew 27, where Jesus went to the cross in your place. Yes, you were found guilty. You were condemned. But Jesus went to the cross in your place. And that now redefines the judgment seat for us and makes it a place not of condemnation, but of sweet a blessing to be thankful for. Okay? So that's the first context of this Bema word in the New Testament. Now, if I do my search again and see how else it's used, let's get out of the. If you look at it in Acts and you look at it in the Gospels, it's always a governor sitting, making judgment, you know, listening to people's uh, accusations against someone and judging whether or not, you know. But Paul puts judgment in a different light and loads it with different things. Now, he uses the word bima, we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ in Romans 14.10. What does he say? He says in 14.10, Why do you judge your brother, or why do you set it not your brother? For we shall all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that, uh, to God. So then everyone will give account of himself to God. You know, he's talking about judging your brother in this whole context. And he says, everyone will give account of himself to God. And he says, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat. So you want to judge your brother? Well, he is going to stand at that judgment seat. And so are you. But if you look back at Romans 14, 4, he says the same thing. Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he will stand or fall. Yes, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Once again, at the judgment seat, you have to realize that you have a friend at the judgment seat, an advocate at the judgment seat, okay? And because of that, because of his goodness and because of his covenant, he is not going to strike you down. He's going to make you stand. That's the purpose of the judgment seat is for you to be held up by God. That's what justification did. It turned that judgment seat into a new place for us. Okay. Um, now, he's going to make us stand. Now, when Paul talks about the judgment, I guess the best place to go is really 1 Corinthians 3, where he talks about the day of Christ revealing the nature of our work. Okay, So, he says, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 3, 9. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. We are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to me, as a wise master builder, I've laid a foundation, and on another found, build on that foundation. But let everyone take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can be laid than that 
which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation of gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be manifested, for the day will declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built on, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet is by fire. Okay? Now, here he's saying that it's not you that is judged, but it is your work, and specifically the building work, which is related to the building up of the body of Christ, and it is related to the kind of materials you use in building, and what kind of foundation you set that building on. So your building work has to be on the foundation which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And not only that, but your work must be the grace of God working in you. So it's got to be a work of grace. You have to have an understanding of grace to get any kind of reward. Because if you're going to do a building work, what that's referring to is how do you nourish the children in God's household with the grace of God so that they can be edified and comforted and so that they can have a bold approach to the Lord and so that he can shine upon them and they won't walk in darkness because they're not afraid of him, but they come boldly to him because they know he loves them. This is the kind of work that will receive a reward. This is building with on the foundation of Jesus Christ with uh, gold, silver, precious stones. But if you build on another foundation, on the flesh, and works, you are building with something that's not imperishable, but st consumables, wood, hay, and stubble. And all of this is going to go through the fire. When the day of Christ comes and we are glorified, we're going to pass through the fire, so to speak. That fire is going to burn off everything negative about our flesh and transform us. It, and yet it's the baptism of fire, I guess. And that is, that's not going to hurt us. Don't worry. We are going to be enjoying the process, I think. But um, the now we'll enter into resurrection but we are someone's fruit, and we are someone's reward. No, but none of us got here without somebody ministering with, on the foundation of Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones. And that's why Paul says, What is my reward? Is it not even you who will be with me at the coming of the Lord? Okay, yes. In 1 Thessalonians uh, 2 19 Paul says for what is our hope our joy and our crown of rejoicing are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming so there's a crown that is a rejoicing and it's the people that you have built Christ into and built upon Christ and who are members of that great edifice the temple of God and when we minister the found uh, uh, whether when we pray and when we consider God's building and we labor to bless the building of God and bless the people of God there's a reward for that and in a very literal sense you know when you see souls saved that is a great reward and those people will pass through that fire and abide now but going back to first corinthians um three real quick um i just want you to see something about the context the context of how he's talking about this strange judgment seat where our works are judged but we ourselves are not and the reason we're not is because that part of the judgment seat has already been accomplished by Jesus Christ. He's already been judged by Pilate as guiltless. We've already been judged by God as guilty. And he's already sacrificed himself for us. And now he's the one standing at the judgment seat. 
as our righteousness, as our merit, as the one who has taken upon himself to secure us and hold us up. So that part is no longer in view. That's already been accomplishment. That's already been accomplished. And so when we go to the judgment seat, we're not meeting Pilate. We're meeting Jesus, our friend, okay, our savior, our beloved bridegroom. And he's there looking, like I said in the last video, for an excuse to give us a, a reward. But I want to talk a little bit about this judgment seat that um, Paul, the way Paul is talking about the building of God. If you go into context here, he's talking about divisiveness in the church because of false apostles who came in and were Judaizing and slapping the saints in the face, trying to put them under the law, trying to make to shut the kingdom of heaven to them, trying to put them in fear and put them in bondage and make them subject to them, okay? Now, he's, see, that's what he's talking about, is those kind of people. And then he starts talking about how... You know, Apollos planted and he watered, but God's the one who gives the increase. But we do receive a reward. It's almost a secondary thing, you know. He's trying to say, look, we're nothing. We didn't do anything. I mean, here, look at 3.6. I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Um, so then, neither is he that plants anything, neither that he that waters, but God that gives the increase. The emphasis is that it's God. Um, and he says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Look, I'm nothing special, is what he's saying. Okay? So the focus of this whole section on the judgment seat isn't even really about you and all that. He's trying to say, in contrast to these people who think they're so great, he's like, I'm nothing. God's just working through me. However, he says we will receive a reward. Now he that plants and he that waters are one and everyone shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So there is a reward, but we're laborers together with God and you are God's building. And then he goes into this whole thing about laying the foundation. We, we don't need to cover that again. But then at the end of that, he says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself should be saved. Yet so is fire by fire. Well, that's good news. Now, know you not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Now he's back to the idea of, look, we're talking about building and you guys are the temple of God. When it comes to working, we're talking about building. And if any man defiles the temple of God, him does God destroy. Because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So look what he's saying. He's saying, look. The reason I'm talking about all this is just as a side note to this context of these people who are trying to bring you into bondage and bring you into fear. And they're not building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. They're building with wood, hay, and stubble, and it's going to be consumed. And their work is going to be uh, manifested in that day. Now, maybe some of them are saved. Well, if so, then they'll be saved as yet through fire, you know. But he's saying, look, but you guys are the temple of God. And you know, the wood, hay, and stubble, really, if you read 1 Corinthians carefully and you read Galatians, you can see that there are enemies of God's building program. They're enemies of the church. They despise the church. They're the dogs. They're the, the ones who insist on mutilating yourself who boast in the flesh, who put confidence in the flesh, and always try to put you under works. They do not believe the gospel that says that God justifies the ungodly who believe even though they work not. The work we do that is rewarded is not any work we do uh, that is apart from God. It's God working. And it's God working for the building up of the saints and nourishing them in the faith. And I guarantee you that if you're one of these trolls that's on every YouTube channel and every time you see someone speak to grace, you jump in and qualify. Yeah, but that, you know, you, you can't just do whatever you want. And, you know, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, and all that stuff. If that's all you're doing, you are going around tearing down the body of Christ. You are 
at best building with wood, hay, and stubble. At worst, if you are stumbling people and defiling the temple and tearing down what God is trying to build up, you're actually probably going to be in trouble. We'll just say that. You know, you may not even be at this judgment seat. You may be at a different one. <laughs> so uh, be careful. This is a sobering to be at this judgment seat is a great privilege to even be there. This is not the judgment in Matthew 25. This is not the Matthew, uh, the one at the end of Revelation. This is a mystery that had been hidden. And it has to do with the resurrection of the church. And it will occur some point at the rapture and the catching up and the resurrection at that time when we are in the air with the Lord. It may happen in a heartbeat, or it may take a seven-year period. I, I don't really know, except I do know that those 24 elders in Revelation 5 have already received their crowns. And they cast them at the feet of Jesus because they know that it was his grace operating through them. And they're representatives of the church. Now, I just want to do a few ending verses to confirm that the judgment seat that we're going to is a judgment of reward um, and a happy thing uh, and then I need to close this up because I'm at 35 minutes I try not to ever do one more than 40 because I know people it's hard to I, I know it's hard to watch all this it's a lot hopefully it's ministering to people I always say that hopefully this is uh, helping someone because I think that there's probably one or two people that this is intended for so I do it um, and I'm, ha I'm happy to do it because I'm edified by doing it and I'm thankful when I'm done. And even if I'm just preaching to myself, that's pretty good, you know, uh, making me happy. Um, okay. So real quick. So if I search in the new Testament for the phrase unto salvation, um, this is the verse I'm looking for. Okay. And it was appointed for my unto men wants to die but after this the judgment so we know when you know there's a judgment for us so christ was offered to bear the sins of many okay he came once and he bore the sins once and for all and unto them who look for him that's the believers in christ shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so the first time he came to bear the sins the second time, he's not coming back and referencing the sins. He bore those the first time. The second time, he's appearing to those who appear, uh, to those who look for him, meaning all the believers. He shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. So this judgment seat, when he appears, is a salvation. It's not a condemnation. It's a salvation. Are you really looking to the Lord's coming as a salvation, or are you looking to it as a condemnation? If you're looking to it as a condemnation, then you're going to shrink back in fear when he comes, and it's because you don't understand. It's not because something's wrong with you. It's because you haven't grasped the nature of his coming. So I've said this in another video, but this is one of my favorite verses. Um, perfectly. This is in for, uh, Peter... Uh, Grace brought. I have so many translations in my mind that it's hard for me to find it in the King James sometimes now. Um, okay, 1 Peter 1 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and what? Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when he comes, you are going to receive grace. There's a grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What kind of grace is that? It is a grace unto salvation. Looking back here, you know, talking about how you, your faith is going to be, it's much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tried with fire, 1 Peter 1, 7. It might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What will be found to honor and glory at his appearing? your faith what faith the faith that saves you and what is it that that faith believes in it believes that jesus christ died for your sins and is coming again for your salvation he's coming without sin unto salvation for those who look to him whom having not seen we love in whom though you not see him now 
yet believing, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is the end of your faith? It's the salvation of your soul. So what is the end of this race when we see the Lord? Is it a punishment? No, it's the salvation of your soul. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. See, there's a grace coming to you. Searching what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. So when it comes, when Jesus comes and is revealed, there's a grace that's coming to you at that revelation. And that grace is the salvation of your soul. And it is glory that will follow. This is something that look we look forward to, to the point where it causes us to love him and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, uh, finally, when it comes to the race, I just want to uh, talk about, oh, wait, the reward. He comes with, his reward is with him. Let's look at reward. Okay, let's look at the word reward real quick, and let's search for that in Revelation, because there's a verse I'm looking for. Here it is. Revelation 22 at the end of the whole thing. He says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to what his work will be. So, what is he coming with? He's coming with rewards for the believers. Okay? This is a good news thing when he's coming. And these are just starter verses. You can really dig into this and look into the crowns and, and, and find a find a good dispensational study on the doctrine of rewards. And this will change your concept and make you yearn for that day and even eagerly look forward to rewards. That right now, if you're the kind of person who's under condemnation, you probably haven't even imagined that you're getting any reward. You think he's coming to punish you. You've got to abolish that concept and lay hold of justification. Justification covers you from the minute you believe and brings you all the way into glory. It's not a partial thing. It will conform you to the image of Christ. The righteousness through which the life of God is being dispensed is this imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is your merit, he is your righteousness, he is your sanctification, he is your hope of glory, and when he comes, he's going to give you himself fully, and you're going to be fully conformed to his image, and that's going to be your salvation. Furthermore, you're going to be rewarded just for that. You're going to have a reward just for looking to his appearance. You're going to have a reward just for believing him. I don't know that you there will really be any genuine believer there who runs his race and continues to hold on to the faith, faith who is not rewarded at some level when he comes. The ones who have nothing and are saved yet as through fire have to have been brought through some pretty they it's got to be pretty bad i mean like maybe that brother who was sleeping with his father's wife if he'd been taken home and hadn't repented i'll bet he might he probably wouldn't have had reward or if you've stumbled people your whole life and you've been the kind of person like one of these internet trolls who by some miracle you're saved, so you believe that Jesus died for your sins, and yet you're continually always bringing people under condemnation every time you open your mouth, you are really going to have nothing. Now, you may be saved as yet through fire, but chances are you're probably not saved to begin with. Because if your agenda is to tear down the body of Christ everywhere you go, Oh, but then there are some who are just so under condemnation and so confused because they've been so beaten and so whipped that they need to be resuscitated and healed so that they can have some rewards. And like I said, I'm the last, I'm the 11th hour labor of the 59th minute of the 59th second of the 11th hour. And you know what? Our reward is as good as the one who labored faithfully all the way from the beginning because that's what he said about the 11th hour laborers they get the same wage and it's unfair but it's the grace of god 
And it's the grace of God that's going to be revealed in that day and put on display, as it says in Ephesians 1, 5, that we will be to the praise of the glory of his grace. And this is God's work being put on display, his building, and it is a big, it is his testimony. And as the angels look at it, they're going to rejoice and be in awe at what God made out of these sinful people. So, um... This is all I can say for now, but this is just a little study to show the difference between the three different judgment seats and make you realize that we should not be looking forward to punishment. We should be looking forward to salvation, reward, and seeing our friend and bridegroom. Amen.